Oh, sorry. Sorry. Yeah. Says he's been busy, which I came up in my ear saying recording in progress. How very formal. Yeah, good evening, everyone. It's very weird uh, whenever I do one of these kind of Zoom things because I can't see anyone other than Jess. So I've got no idea if everyone's falling asleep or walked out the room and just left it on to make it look like they're not being rude and things like that. So the pressure's on you, Jess, to kind of make it look like you're being entertained and et cetera. Um, so we're going to spend the next hour-ish. You know, some of you will probably know what I can be like and can talk for England about nature, but especially plants and fungi and things like that. Um, we'll, I've, I've kind of split the talk into a bit about plants, berries kind of things at this time of year we can forage and then fungi because what's life without fungi, eh? They are the most important things. Um, so shall we crack on? I'm going to, moment of truth, I'm going to share my screen and find out if all this works. And we press play. Jess, does that look all right? Can you see my screen? That's all working. Okay. It's a shame, Jess, that you're um, the only one I can see because it means that you're the one I have to pick on for this. So everyone can take part in this. We'll just get our little grey cells warmed up whenever we're talking about foraging because we're connecting with your inner cave person. We're going right back to being primitive and looking at plants in the wild and wondering whether we can eat them or not and trying to work out which ones we can eat, which ones we can't. I'm sure there's lots of people who <sighs> gave humanity some great information by finding out you can't eat those ones. Um, so without any further ado, Jess, you are the sole participant in this of edible, deadable. So everyone, anyone who wants to take part can just write in the chat whether you think edible or poisonous. I'm going to show you five different species. They are either edible slash medicinal. Um, we'll count all that, you know, whether useful as edible. And anything that's poisonous or deadly will count as deadable. So five different species. Just you are the one that edit my articles that I send you every month about all these things. So let's see exactly how much information you have absorbed. There's no pressure, okay? There's no right or wrong answers. But if you get them wrong, you're dead. So start with the little gray cells, this leaf. Do you want to eat it, Jess, or not? Ooh. Um, I'm going to go with no. You're going to go with no. Why? Is this because... Just you're a pure you're, gut instinct. <laughs> you're a typical, typical Brit and kind yeah. of like, we don't forage, we don't do that over here, you know. Um, yeah, it's, it's a bizarre thing. Why, you, you don't, do you even recognise it? I'm starting to think now it might be a nettle, in which case you can eat it. <laughs> so which one are you going with? Are you uh, going with no or, or yes? I'm going to choose yes then. Yes, well, it's correct, because that is a nettle. <laughs> so of course it's edible. One of, the great, one of the great things I love is when you photograph plants and fungi, you just put them on white backgrounds, you totally isolate them from everything else. They look very, very different, you know, but it allows you to kind of really look at the minutiae of, of what they are. An easy one. Um, deadable. Deadable. Because it's a mushroom and it's purple. Yeah. <laughs> Are you literally judging a book by its cover? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, maybe I'll give you. I'll give you a chance to stick or twist by giving you its name. So this is the amethyst right. deceiver. Well, deceiver doesn't sound great. I have to say. So. <laughs> I can stick with no. Purple, purple mushroom um, called the amethyst deceiver. You know, yeah. Every, yeah. No, it's edible. Okay. Edible and delicious. So, yeah, you, you're out of the game at this point, I'm afraid. <laughs> but you're going to have to carry on because you're going to have to tell me whether you'd eat this one or not. Um. Yes. You would. Why? I think it's a chive. You think it's a chive? <laughs> This is, it's, this always comes up, this one. This is why I included <laughs> it, because again, as soon as you isolate it and take it out of context, yeah, it does look like chive, but you've mm. also stumbled across another plant that you can use. So even though this oh. is not chive, it is in the edible family. This is thrift, or sometimes referred to as sea pink, a coastal plant that grows on all the kind of rocky coastlines and things like that. But out of context, and when you see it like mm. this, it just look a bit like chive. The flat, the flower <laughs> to leaf ratios off a bit, yeah. but yeah. 
Not too bad. There you go. Um, I'm going to go with edible. Edible or deadable? Edible. Edible. Why? You're going to tell me because it looks like the kind of ones you get at the supermarket, aren't yeah. you? Yeah. Yeah. It's almost as if I've heard all these before. <laughs> um, it would, but if you saw that in the supermarket, would you not be questioning why it's bright yellow? Um, perhaps it doesn't look as bright yellow on my screen. I can only see a couple okay. of patches of yellow on it. Okay, on mine, that's here's really bright and here's really bright. This is called the yellow stainer. It's the mushroom that causes the most poison cases in the UK each uh. year. <laughs> so because it's in the agaricus family, these white button mushrooms um, and kind of portobellos are all in this family. Um, people think, you know, look at it and go, oh, that looks familiar mm. and eat it. But it stains yellow and it smells really bad as well. It smells of phenol, so ink. And the more you cook it, the inkier it smells. So it has lots of warning signs saying, don't eat me. But what's interesting is many people that I've heard who, who've kind of said to me they've mistaken it, they can't smell it. As if like there's some mechanism in their, in their nostrils that doesn't pick up the smell. So one of the key characteristics is then mist, which means they're mm. far more likely to get poisoned. Uh, right, your last one. Um... I'm going to go with deadable. You're going to go with deadable because it's blue. Uh, just because it looks like not much to eat on there. Okay. <laughs> Instinctively, you would go not edible because there's something about blue food that would immediately make you suspicious. Mm -hmm. um, just your inner cave person talking to you again, <laughs> saying blue, that's not usual. Um, yeah. But sadly, this is edible. Well, not sadly, <laughs> it's great. It would be very frowned upon to pick this from the wild, but it's quite easy to grow in the garden. This is oyster plant. The leaves taste exactly like oysters. Mm. Um, it's very delicious. Grows right on the shingle on the beaches. Used to be found all around the UK, but now climate change is all, is all but making it extinct in the UK. So it's, its distribution has gone sh really sharp, uh, sharply northwards. And now if you want to see it, I, I saw it on the uh, Giant's Causeway in Northern Ireland. I think that's one of the more subtly kind of distributions in the UK. The Scottish islands and, and the far north of Scotland are its stronghold, but even there it's declining. The seed of the plant goes into the sea and then gets washed back up. But the seed needs to be in the water for a set amount of time for the seed to germinate. But it needs to be a certain temperature and as sea temperatures increase, it obviously is retreating further and further north because it's too warm for this for this plant. So oh. it's drastically declining, but we can grow it in the garden. Um, it's very, very delicious. So you did uh, pretty poorly, Jess. Yeah. You know? <laughs> so. Although I don't think I would have died. I think I would have just not eaten lots of things. So maybe yeah, died hunger. Yeah, we, yeah, that's, yeah, that's the thing. Although it means that I get to write articles, uh, blogs for another 12 months because, you know, I yeah. need to brush, brush up for uh, the apocalypse, etc. Yeah. So, <laughs> so um, how I got interested in, in nature and foraging is through my grandma. This is Grandma Edna. And it's the whole reason why we're talking foraging now is because a jay landed on a bit of lawn in a Norfolk caravan park in 1964. That's, you know, that bird landing on that lawn is the reason why I'm here with Jess. We're talking about plants and things like that. It's weird how this things happen. But my grandma saw this jay on the lawn outside this caravan where she was on holiday and was like, oh, such a beautiful bird and wanted to know the name of it. Uh, and so she got bought herself a book, just, you know, was fell in love with this, this bird and then wanted to start learning some of the other ones and eventually joined a natural history society. Um, and then I came along. And then when I was about five, six years old, when the rest of the family were going watching Oldham Athletic play football on a Saturday afternoon, because they were mad football fans, I rebelled against football and I got fobbed off to grandma to go and to look after me for the day. Well, she used to take me out into the woods because by then she developed a love for mushrooms and fungi. She was, she was a language teacher. She was obsessed with the scientific names. Um, and she used to pay me 
used to pay me to find mushrooms for her. One penny for every common species, two pennies if it was uncommon, and five pennies if it was rare. And at the end of the walk, we'd pass an old fashioned sweet shop, and with whatever I'd earned in mushrooms, I'd get in sweets. And as you can tell, I did all right. And it, that just got me hooked from a young age. It is a treasure hunt. You go out into the woods and have got no clue what you're going to find. And just round the corner, these, these beautiful mushrooms of different colours and shapes and sizes and weird corals and clubs and jellies, all really, really kind of um, weird and wacky things that for a kid, it's just magical, you know, being in the woods, you know, in the autumn, uh, looking for these things. And then as I got older, I got more interested in the kind of the names of them, the understanding of them, how they worked. And then when I was kind of, you know, a little bit older, more interested in birds and moths and butterflies and plants, particularly with plants with the mythology and folklore and uses of them. Um, so that's how I got interested. And then when I went to university, I did my degree in wildlife photography, useless degree, but I wanted a degree and I was going to do something I enjoyed anyway. Um, but uh, that's my background. So that's me in a nutshell. Um, so without any further ado, let's talk about everything you can go out at the moment and find and use and how to use them. So flavor of the month is slows. So I have a little uh, bone to pick with people who call them slow berries because there's no such thing as a slow berry. They're called slows. The slow is one of the most iconic -y British foraging hedgerow kind of plant to use because if you mention foraging or recipes from foraging people immediately say either things like alderflower cordial or slow gin and slow is very small but kind of marble size member of the plum family and they are revolting and some of you who will have been on uh, some of my events if you've been on them at this time of the year you will know I like to get people who have never ever tasted a slow in their life to try one because as soon as you bite into it, it dries your mouth out. It's acrid, it's hot, bitter. You get this plummy taste, but they're not very pleasant. You can understand why the only recipe that kind of has lasted the test of time with using them is to whack them in a jar of gin and sugar and leave them for three months to make them palatable. They're a very, very difficult uh, fruit to use because of this really, really quite bitter uh, note to it. However, if you are determined to make a bottle of slow gin, now is the time to do it. Theoretically, if we go off a really, really traditional slow gin recipe, you would have to wait until the first frost. The frost freezes the sugars inside and then breaks them down as, as they thought, so immediately making the berries sweeter. Now, with the way the weather is these years, sometimes we don't even get a frost till March. You could be waiting an awfully long time to make your slow gin. Better to pick them, put them in the freezer overnight, take them out, it does exactly the same thing. Um, but if you're going to make your slow gin, you have to pick all the slows from one bush and then take a thorn from the bush. So there's no such thing as a slow bush. It is a black thorn that produces slows. It's not slow berries either. They are just slows, S-L-O-E. And the black thorn gets its name because it has very, very large thorns, almost like needles. They're very sharp. Um, and what you would do is you, when you're putting all the slows into a kilner jar or whatever to use, you prick each slow with a thorn from the black thorn you pick them from. So then it can infuse the flavor and into the into the gin. Or you could use vodka or whiskey or whatever. Um, no one has that amount of time in this day and age. It's better just to whack them all in a killer jar and use a potato mash just to crush them up so all the juice gets going. But if you want to be really traditional, you have to do it with a thorn from the black thorn you pick them from. They're very, very small. What's better to use, if you can find them, are bullaces. Bullaces are another member of the plum family, but they're like slows on steroids. They're like, you know how you get small marbles? These are like the big marbles. Um, they're much bigger, very, 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 very closely related to damsons. And in fact, a lot of people who make damson gin from the wild are probably not using real damsons. They're using bullaces. In terms of flavor, I can't tell the difference. They taste exactly the same. It's just bullaces are generally very round, whereas damsons are quite oval in shape. Um, and damsons themselves originate from Damascus, which is where the name damson comes from. Um, but these are far, well, A, they're bigger, 
So you don't need to pick as many if you wanted to make bullus or dams and gin. Um, and they're not bitter. So you can use less sugar as well. So it's a bit healthier, although we don't make slow gin because it's healthy anyway. We don't make these liqueurs because they're healthy. We make them because they're delicious. Um, and alcohol is a very common theme in this household about uh, how, how do we preserve things? It's always in alcohol because alcohol is a preservative. That's the only reason you know, I'm trying to capture the essence of autumn, not because I've got a drinking problem before anyone says anything. That's just a, that's just a slanderous lie that I keep hearing that, you know, the amount of bottles of weird liqueurs I have must must be a problem. But they're quite common in lowland parts. So Cheshire, South Manchester. Um, we find bullaces where I was where I grew up in Rochdale. We never found these. Even blackthorns were quite hard to come by. Um, when you get up into the hills, the plums don't really like it. It's too wet, too cold, too miserable. Um, the sunny uplands of kind of Stockport and you know Trafford and places like that are uh, far more productive for for these kind of fruit. That's the re the reality of, of foraging is that. Some things are very difficult to find on your doorstep through a variety of reasons. It might be the case of they haven't been planted because lots of lots of these kind of hedgerows things have been planted at some point or because the, you, the habitat's not right. You know, it's either the soil's too alkaline, too acidic, too neutral. You know, there's all sorts of reasons. But there are some plants that no matter where you go, you will find. So hawthorn is possibly the most overlooked hedgerow plant we have in terms of foraging. I very rarely see anyone utilising hawthorn. Yet it is an incredibly versatile plant to use. So in spring, the flowers and leaves are edible. Not very strong flavoured, but very... but a great addition to a salad and the berries at this time of the year which aren't technically berries if we're being really scientific they are haws h-a-w and they have a slightly appley flavor biologically speaking they are very closely related to apples um and when you cook with them and stew them up they take on a very appley flavor and aroma um they're also great for making fruit levers if you want to make like a fruit roll up um, you can get loads of kind of uh, hawthorn berries, pull, mash them through a sieve and the pulp, if you kind of spread it out and dry it, you can add a bit of sugar to taste if you want. You basically made a fruit roll up. Um, and because the pulp is quite, it's not very wet, it's an easy one to start with. When you start trying to make blackberry fruit leathers and roll ups, because they're a bit more liquidy, you've, it's a bit of an art form getting it all to spread and stay when you're trying to dry it. Um, but Hawthorne's great for lowering blood pressure as well. So it's, it's been proven that the flowers, the leaves and the, and the fruits all lower blood pressure, it contains a chemical that widen the arteries. So if you've got high blood pressure, Hawthorne's really good to use. If you have low blood pressure, you need to be slightly wary about using it. There is some evidence to suggest it regulates blood pressure. But from what I've read, there is enough to support, you know, just to be if you've got low blood pressure, just be out, air on the side of caution. Um, but it's a great plant to use. The Irish would say hawthorn bakes the sweetest bread. And that's because the wood of hawthorn, it grows really slowly. When you get a really good hawthorn hedge, and we're not talking about those little small box hedges that most of the kind of countryside seems to be littered with. We're talking about big, dense hedgerows which is what we really want to grow kind of four or five meters deep with brambles growing through them and they're not you know they're not neat rectangular boxes um but when you get to the heart of those hawthorns which could be 100 150 years old they grow so slowly the wood's really dense and when you burn it it burns really hot so the Irish always, you know, if you're baking bread and using a wood burning stove, it's always with hawthorn because it gets a really good temperature, which species like, well, elm and elder, you would never use. Eld, uh, elm burns cold, really cold. It's bizarre for, you know, when you see it on, on you see it, this wonderful flame and you think it's going to be really hot and it's not, it's, it's bizarre. Um, but it's really common. Hawthorn you find absolutely everywhere. Less common, but still abundant in all of the kind of hedgerows around, well, wherever you are, which out, out of interest, if anyone, if you want to type in the chat where you are from, it just gives Jess and myself an idea about, you know, is everyone just from Bolton or is everyone from all corners of the UK? So you want to type in chat where you're from. 
plus if someone says they're from you know somewhere near me then i'm going to be very vague about where i go foraging because i don't want everyone taking my plants but anyway um elder so don't ever burn elder because if you burn elder wood you invite death into the family so yeah if you've got a log burning stove never use elder wood but elder is our friend it's our friend for a number of reasons one it keeps the devil away so traditional gaelic cottages would always have an elder in the back garden because it was a protective tree it would stop the devil from entering the house and it's also useful in other in other respect because in summer it produces elderflowers so we can make our elderflower cordial or our elderflower marmalade but in the autumn it produces these wonderful dark berries which are just absolutely gorgeous but they're slightly toxic and heat vinegar or alcohol destroys the toxin so as soon as you if you're making elderberry syrup or cordial it's perfectly fine if you're making elderberry vinegar and that is possibly the easiest and best hedgerow recipe you could do it's absolutely delicious so just find a slow gin recipe which is usually find a kilner jar however big you want it fill it two-thirds with the berries sugar to taste and cover with liquid now that if you're making gin that would be gin or vodka or alcohol but you could easily use uh, white wine vinegar or apple cider vinegar if you're wanting to make a flavored vinegar and they're absolutely delicious if you add a quite a bit of sugar to it you make like an elderberry vinegar glaze really thick and it's absolutely delicious it's also very good for you if you don't add the sugar it's really good for you especially if you use organic apple cider vinegar then it's incredibly good for you because elderberries are known to contain lots of vitamin c and antioxidants it's very effective at fighting cold and flu most cold and flu remedy that's on the market now often has you know we'll say on the label with elderberry extract you know it's very very effective so one of the problems you have in in the house in the home is we have these wonderful flavors how do we preserve them how do we you know it, we don't just want to eat a load of you know mushrooms right now it's all about preserving them the same with fruits we can do that with jams but sometimes you know you want something that's not a jam and is going to last a flavored vinegar is great and it's it's because vinegar is such a good preservative um and very kind of you can do all sorts with it you can make cocktails with flavored vinegars so before refrigeration going back to kind of prohibition america um in most parts they didn't have refrigeration you know they get the delivery of those massive blocks of ice and things like that but they would make cordials without water and use vinegar and they're called shrubs and to our modern you know 2021 palette that sounds like well why would you want to drink a, you know a glass of elderberry vinegar topped up with water or soda it sounds repulsive but that's because we've got very 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 sweet palettes now go back 100 120 years very different it would have been totally normal to kind of drink a vinegar based drink um but they're coming into fashion. If you go to some of the trendy bars in Chester, Liverpool, Manchester, Salford, places like that, um, you'll see on the menu, you know, this cocktail and in, in it will say like with a raspberry shrub. And you're like, ooh, this sounds delicious. But it basically means it's a cordial made with vinegar rather than, rather than water. If you've got things like a, um, oh, what's the word? Pasteurizer. Um, then you can preserve cordials and things like that quite easily most people don't and it's quite difficult to do in a domestic kitchen a vinegar make it bottle it put it in the pantry it's done pretty much keeps uh, whereas cordials have a shelf life of well four to six weeks depending on on uh, how you've made it and things like that so yeah it's one of my favorites to use elder but don't eat them raw off the bush if you eat enough of them you'll certainly have an upset stomach um yeah you want to lose a couple of pounds very quickly then there's quite a few berries you can eat raw that will definitely help you lose a couple of pounds. I need to bring out a whole range of Dave's diet supplements of, you know, you've got a wedding at the weekend and you need to lose four or five pounds. I've got a mushroom just for you. Um, it won't be pleasant, but you'll look great for the, uh, for the weekend. Um, Rowan, I've included Rowan because it's one of my favorite plants because 
in our traditional cottage, we would have the elder in the back, we would have the rowan in the front, because the rowan will keep witches away. Rowan is a very, very protective tree in terms of protecting us from evil. The berries themselves, it's difficult to see on this picture, but the bottom of the berries have a five pointed pentagram. And because of, of that, it was treated in very high regard because although we think about the pentagram as being associated with witchcraft and things like that, it is a protective symbol. So the fact that this tree is covered in fruit that have all these protective symbols on it must be a good thing. So they were often planted in people's front gardens to keep witches away. Um, the fact that it is also an edible fruit is just another happy coincidence. You treat it the same as elder, though, in that it is not very pleasant to eat raw. You shouldn't eat it raw at all. But heat, alcohol, vinegar renders it safe. So if you're making something like an elderberry, uh, a rowan and crabapple jelly, that's fine. If you're doing a rowan schnapps, that's fine. A rowan vinegar, that's fine. Um, it's one of the favorite fruit of the thrushes. So at this time of the year, the Red Wings and Field Fair are arriving en masse from Scandinavia. So we've always got to leave enough for the birds. In reality, we don't have to kind of actively leave enough for the birds because when you pick rowan berries, you always take the stuff from the low branches because that's as far as we can reach. We can't reach, you know, 10, 12 meters high with, with some of these trees. Um, and the thrushes like to eat the berries at the top and work their way down. We pick the ones from the bottom and work our way up. In reality, in parts of Greater Manchester, these berries just rot. There are, you know, they, it's such a common plant in urban areas, parks, green spaces. We don't get the winter thrushes arriving in such numbers that to, to strip them. Um, so we don't have to worry too much. Even in the countryside, there's so many rowan trees, it's unreal. Um, it's always it's always great to always have wildlife in mind, you know, not to take everything. In reality, by the time you've taken a few kilos of berries from the lower branches, you will have barely made a dint in the amount of berries there. So we don't need to we don't need to worry too much. Um, and the problem is at the minute, usually there's there's two rowan trees at the back of our house that are absolutely laden. The trouble is, is each year by the end of August, the local blackbird and mizzle thrushes have eaten them all. Um, so any wintering bird, any winter thrushes that do arrive, they won't be visiting here, that's for sure. And they're a favourite of the waxwings. So waxwings are an occasional winter visitor from Scandinavia. There's usually an eruption once every five years where these birds arrive en masse and they only ever seem to target rowan trees in supermarket car park, council estates, really urban places. Because where these birds breed is really high up in the Arctic. So when they're born, they never see people. They've got no idea to be afraid of them at all. So they're absolutely fearless. So they, you can literally walk under a tree that's got wax wings in and they're not bothered by you in the slightest. It's bizarre, but you never look for wax wings in the countryside. They're always very urban, you know, which is probably a wise thing as well because they'll be safe from other predators because there's a load of people around. You know, the sparrowhawks aren't going to like it, you know, hunting in some of the supermarket car parks when there's the hustle and bustle going on. So it's a kind of safe place for them as well. But we'll have to see, we'll know in the next week or two whether it's looking like a, a bad year in Scandinavia, which pushes them down into the UK. Um, usually we'll start getting the initial, the initial scouts coming over that report back and say, yeah, let's go over. Um, so we shall see. Oh, wait. The great thing, so obviously I was, I was born in Rochdale, but Manchester on my doorstep, and the foraging is as cosmopolitan as the people that live in Greater Manchester. So you always find the native plants, however we want to define that, the ones that have been here since, you know, as long as records began. Um, but there's always weird and wacky stuff to find, you know, in urban parts of Manchester. This is a common berry that occurs all over the county. Uh, and this is Chinese bramble, and it's a member of the bramble family, but it differs in that it doesn't have black berries, it has red berries, and the stems are furry, not thorny. So when you're picking them, you never get any hands shredded by, you know, a branch and things like that. They taste really, really nice. They're slightly seedy. So if you like your jam where you're picking the seeds out for the rest of the day, this is the one for you. 
otherwise a jelly, a, a nice Chinese bramble jelly is absolutely delicious. The leaves are very glossy, they're almost evergreen. In fact, it looks like an evergreen because they shed the leaves so slowly, it practically is. Very low growing, it doesn't, it doesn't scramble through the brushes like normal brambles do. It's a, it's a ground creeper. But it's one of these plants that no one picks. So whenever you find a patch, you know, you know, you always know where all the best bramble patches are in Greater Manchester because you either see people picking them or you can tell they've been picked because it's one of the few plants the general public feel confident in picking. And it's a weird one because actually blackberries from the bramble are one of the most complicated groups of plants we have in the UK. So there are 575 at least different types of blackberry in the wild in the UK each one producing a slightly different fruit. Each one produces slightly different flowers. So some are white, some are pink, some are purple, some are red, some are yellow. Some of them have different leaves. Some are cut, heavily cut, look like parsley. Some are round, some are circular, some are oval, some are almost kind of triangular. Some are glossy, some are matte, some are evergreen, some are, the stems can be really big, really small, really big thorns, small thorns, widely spaced thorns, close together thorns. Then the berries themselves, big berries, small berries, loads of little lobes on it, you know, disintegrate when you pick them really firm. Or you, you can understand when you've got all that going on, you can easily get all these different varieties. And it's the reason why at this time of the year, if you're going out picking up the last of the blackberries, because some fruit early, some fruit late. So some varieties are just coming into their stride now. So blackberry season isn't technically over, although if you go off the folklore of Michaelmas, so depending which calendar you use, depending something like the 29th of September or the 10th of October, after Michaelmas Day, the devil has come to the, come to the surface of earth and spat and fouled upon all the blackberries. So we have to stop picking them because apparently the devil has nothing better to do than just doing that with blackberries. But there's a kind of method in the madness. So when Michaelmas daisy is in flower, which is a little daisy like flower that's purple, very common around the ring, the M60 kind of uh, motorway, all across the kind of verges. You see that at this time of the year, purple flowers, that's Michaelmas daisy. When it's in flower, you stop picking the blackberries. And generally it's because most of them have gone over. So there is some, with all these kind of old wives tale, there is a reason for it. But some varieties naturally do fruit later. Um, so when you go for your walk, mark every bush you pick blackberries off out of 10. And I guarantee you will start seeing massive differences between each bush because they're probably different varieties. A typical park in Greater Manchester might have 10 or a dozen species of bramble. Um, so don't just settle on the first blackberries you find see what they're good for. The Himalayan giant, which is an invasive bramble and possibly our commonest bramble in Greater Manchester now, slipped under the radar because it's a bramble, it just blends in. And it's not until you realize it's not the same kind of bramble. Um, it's as invasive as Japanese knotweed and Himalayan balsam. It's a very, very aggressive bramble, but blends in and it produces massive blackberries that are delicious. So it can stay. You know, it's going to produce really fat, juicy blackberries. This is my blackberry and lavender jam. Blackberry and lavender jam is absolutely amazing. Um, it's just getting the balance of the lavender right. Too much, it just tastes like, you know, your grandma's perfume kind of thing. Um, it's whenever you work with floral plants, rose is the same. Rose petals, you know, it's a fine line between Turkish delight and soap, you know. Got to find that perfect balance. So even the blackberry, even the humble blackberry is not that straightforward. There are some interesting things to find, though. So when I, people assume when we talk about foraging, we're going off into the countryside. Not always the case. You know, like I say, urban parks, cemeteries, you know, gardens, they can be really, really productive. Kind of public gardens as opposed to jumping over, you know, three doors down and, and raiding their veg plot. Don't do that. Um, but... Some of the, lots of the cemeteries around Greater Manchester have walnuts. Walnuts are a really common tree planted in, in urban parks. And the byproduct is, is they produce walnuts. And depending when you want to pick them, you could either just pickle them or you could wait to actually get the fruit. It seems like the squirrels don't bother with them. So 
things like hazelnuts are good luck in greater manchester trying to pick hazelnuts because there's so many squirrels around you've got to get up very very early to beat them to them but walnuts seem i mean one year i think i picked something like 13 14 kilos of walnuts from from almost around manchester city center um it's crazy you know just to just be rotting on the ground otherwise because no you know nothing else is eating them um so you can, you know, you can get some weird, wacky things right on our doorstep. It's weird at this time of the year. I know it's, it's we're almost exactly the furthest away from when wild garlics were flowering, and the furthest away until they flower. So we're kind of at that point now where it's like I get massive cravings for wild garlic because it's like oh, I've got to wait so long for the fl- the flowers, especially that I love. I mean, the, the leaves will be out in a few months. Picking, because this is the thing, we're coming out of autumn and we kind of think the end of the season. It's kind of, it says for fruits and nuts, but the leaves of all the spring stuff will be starting to come out in the next few weeks because they need to get a head start ready for spring. So wild garlic leaves can be out as early as early December. So we're talking, what, we're six weeks away? You know, I in a very mild winter, I'll pick wild garlic pretty much on Christmas Day the leaves of it because with foraging it is seasonal but you've got to know exactly when that season is and if you think wild garlic is at its best if you go into a woodland and when you walk into the woodland it stinks of wild garlic you are mistaken because if it stinks of wild garlic it's because it's rotting or certainly the leaves are rotting that's why it smells so at that point don't even think about using the leaves you switch to the stem and the flowers because the leaves have been out for months and months and months. You know, if you're going into a woodland in May or June and it stinks of wild garlic, the leaves are probably six months old. So the, that's, that's why they smell because they're breaking down. So long as it's mild, late January, February, early March, the leaves are so sweet and delicious and they don't, they're not pungent. They're just this wonderful salad leaf. So even though you think we're coming into winter, Technically, this is when, you know, late November, December, that's when spring starts. It's a weird, it's a weird one. Whenever I talk about autumn foraging, you know, people get annoyed when I refer to autumn in July, you know, but it's nuts, seeds, berries, they are autumn, in my opinion. It's just that some of them can appear in July. So we have to think about, um, you know, what, even though we're looking at what we can use now, we are still putting pins in things to say, I'm coming for you shortly. You know, Japanese knotweed is another one. It's an interesting one, and you've got to be very careful from when you pick it. But in early spring, when Japanese knotweed starts to grow, you can cut it when it looks like little pink asparagus spears like this and replace any recipe pound for pound with Japanese knotweed over rhubarb, and you won't taste the difference because basically Japanese knotweed is in the rhubarb family. When, if you stew it up, it tastes exactly like rhubarb. There are restaurants down in London that sell Japanese knotweed and custard for 10, 11, 12 pounds. You know, that's how mad it is. A very invasive plant um, has an incredible root system, which, can, which is why it's very difficult to get rid of. Um, it was brought over by the Victorians and it's an incredibly impressive plant. It's beautiful. It's, you know, the way it grows, it looks like a bamboo forest. It can grow to three, four meters tall, um, but it can outcompete a lot of our native flora and we need to kind of keep on top of it, but it's very difficult to do with it being so widespread. So many cuts to funding through, you know, for landowners, councils to get on top of it. So it's very selective, the battles they fight now. But if it hasn't been poisoned, and you can always tell an area where it's been poisoned with Japanese, with uh, where the Japanese knotweed has been treated with things like glyphosate. If it hasn't, yeah, in early spring when you get these shoots, absolutely delicious. You know, Japanese knotweed sorbet, wines, you know, jellies and jams. It's absolutely fantastic. When they start producing their leaves, the outer stem becomes quite tough, so it be, you get it's a very short window of when you can really use it. Um, so something to think about for next year, just make sure it's not been treated. You can always ask the landowner if it's been treated or not. And again, we are into October, but by the end of November, I'll be thinking about looking for my first in-flower lesser celandine. 
I know whenever I go for a walk and have a Christmas day or boxing day, I always manage to find a lesser celandine in, uh, lesser celandine in flower. Um, most of them are in flower February, March, April, but there's always some that are out really, really early. It is, it's a plant that we used to think was edible. We now think shouldn't really be eaten or if it is, it should be really well cooked. Just avoid it anyway. There's far tastier things to find. Wherever you find lesser celandine, there's usually wild garlic nearby. So why go for this when there's, you know, something much, much tastier nearby. But I've included it because I like some of the old names for plants. One of the books on the shelves behind me has got a list of all the old kind of local and, and, and different names we had for some of these plants. And Lesser Celandine's old name is Pilewort because it was thought you, you could use it and get rid of piles. But the trouble is the book doesn't say how. So I just kind of imagined, because if you uproot this plant, the roots look like they have piles. So medicine going back hundreds of years was basically, what does this look like? And that's what it'll cure. So lungwort, the leaves look like a pair of infected lungs. So it will cure any lung problem. It doesn't, but that's where medicine was. It's so the fact that the roots of this plant look like they have piles. Well, there you go. I just imagine, you know, uproot the plant and bend over and replant it. You know, maybe that'll, maybe that'll cure it, but who knows? Same with colt's foot. Colt's foot is, is one of our earliest flowering plants. And it's that question, isn't it? Is it, is it really early? Or is it our latest flowering plant? You know, because again, some, some years I see colt's foot in flower late November, December. The odd ones and twos, generally February, March uh, is when they're at their best. But again, we start thinking at this time of the year, I'm thinking ahead for, for next year and keeping an eye out on these things. So, you know, another eight weeks, I'll probably see a colt's foot in flower, so long as we're not under 10 feet of snow. If that's the case, then obviously everything gets pushed back a bit. But it's an interesting plant, cult's foot. It's old, it's old, old Latin name is Phileus Antipatrum, son before the father. And it gets that name because it flowers first, then the leaves come out later in the year. So very late, you know, in winter and in, in early spring, the flowers emerge like this, looking a bit like dandelions, but with no leaves. And that's how you know it's colt's foot because it doesn't have any leaves with it. The leaves come out much, much later in the year. Um, and colt's foot has been used for treating coughs because lots of its old names are basically coughs, uh, cough wart and um, kind of names like that. Even its scientific name, Tussilago Farfara, roughly translates as cough go far away. And it's known to contain uh, anti-mucilage properties, so it helps to get mucus off the chest. Some of you may have had things like Colt's Foot Rock, you know, from the old sweet shops, which if you get a really chesty cough, then, you know, you have the Colt's Foot Rock, which has a very aniseed flavour because of the plant, because it had, the plant has an aniseed flavour. Um, and, you know, it kind of creates a lot of saliva and meant to ease the throat and get the mucus off the chest. Um, yeah, it's an interesting plant. You can gather the, the, the flowers, chop them up finely, put them in a jar of honey. And if you've got a cough, you take a teaspoon of the honey. And if you, you know, the idea is, is that you get the medicinal properties of the plant and the honey soothes the throat and obviously is a way of, of taking it. Honey's not a preservative. So if you do things like that, it do, don't, you can't keep it for months and months and months and months and months. Um, honey's all right on its own, but if you start adding things to it, it is not a preservative. Um, so you can make, you know, a small batch in the spring and hopefully you won't need to use it because you're not going to have a cough or a cold or anything worse than, at the moment. It's worth mentioning when we talk about foraging, there are things to be very wary of locally. This isn't one of them. This is one of my favourite plants. I'm pretty sure I'm probably saying that for everything we look at. But Sweet Sicily is one of my favourites because all of it tastes of aniseed and the stems are hollow. So in the spring, when this plant occurs, we cut the stems to straw length and we will have a gin and tonic and use a sweet Sicily straw because once we've finished, we can eat it like a licorice stick and it's got the gin infused in, the, in, in it as well. And, and as you're drinking it, the gin and tonic has this wonderful aniseed punch from the, from the straw of the, uh, the sweet Sicily. And it's a great, great plant to use. The seeds later in the year are like little green torpedoes. They're very, very sweet, absolutely delicious. But locally, we do have plants that if you consume, they will kill you. 
So whilst foraging, if you do it sensibly and safely and only pick things which are really obvious, you're going to have a great time. You're going to try some wonderful things, get acquainted with lots of interesting plants. You always have to have it in the back of your mind. There are really, really nasty plants lurking around out there. Nicola, was it the colt's foot or the lesser celandine? It, if it was that one, it's colt's foot. If it's that one, it's lesser celandine. But that's colt's foot. Um, this is hemlock. Now, most people have heard of hemlock because it's what killed Socrates. You know, it was often given to prisoners in, in Rome and, and, and ancient Greece and things like that. You know, they would be given a concoction of hemlock to drink and it would kill them. There's no way that happened. There's no way on earth that happened at all. Socrates was not killed with this plant. I guarantee it because although this plant is very deadly, it tastes revolting and it smells of rat like strongly rodenty, has a really, really bad smell. The fact that it's a member of the Umbellifer family, so in the same family as the Sweet Sicily, same family as wild carrot, cow parsley, lots of edible plants. The Umbellifer family contains some really sinister ones. It has lots of purple blotches on the stem, which is how I know it's hemlock. There's no way that anyone would be able to stomach, like literally drink a lot of it without throwing it up. It just, it's not likely. It will have been this plant. So at some point through history, hemlock has been mistranslated into exactly which plant we're talking about. This is hemlock water dropwort. Very, very, very closely related to hemlock. Just as deadly, but tastes delicious. Now, if you were going to make a concoction for someone to kill themselves with, it would be this plant because it doesn't, it smells nice, it tastes nice it's the one you're going to use and is very, very deadly. The very sinister thing with hemlock, water dropwort, is when it's young, it looks like celery. As it matures, it looks like wild carrot. And if you uproot it, it looks like a parsnip. So lots of stages of its life, it looks like something edible. And unlike hemlock, which has mechanisms that are going to stop you from eating it because it smells revolting, it tastes bad, so if you do nibble it, you're going to be like, that's disgusting and spit it out. So you don't ingest enough of the poison to, to harm yourself. Don't try it, but, that, you know, in theory. Whereas hemlock water drop what does not have those mechanisms. So you're going to think, oh, this tastes nice. I'm going to eat some more and eat some more and eat some more. And before you know it, you've eaten way too much, you know, for, the, for your body to be able to take anymore. So it's likely it was mistranslated. Hemlock is quite common around Greater Manchester, especially around the M60 motorway it likes drier soils hemlock water dropwort likes its feet near water wet meadows streams rivers lakes ponds um and it's very very common so you, if you if you are interested in foraging this umbella for family you need to be very very wary of because they are lurking around out there um and they're not to be messed with at all one of my favorite Plants, I keep saying, I keep saying that, but this, the thing is, is when you start, when you become a quite, you know, these are, these are my friends, you know, I go out and I like to learn all about them and their stories and they're fascinating. And, it, you know, the humble dandelion is absolutely vilified for no valid reason, you know, and whenever someone says, oh, weeds, dandelions, horrible, when you start asking them why, no one can really answer it. People are just told this dandelions are bad. Yet yeah, they're fantastic for, for invertebrates. They're great for the early bees, the early butterflies, the early moths that appear, because you get that period where you get your first snowdrops and your crocuses, then there's a bit of a gap before the rest of the kind of plants kick in. Well, dandelion for, kind of fills that gap. So it's a great plant to be out for the early pollinators. All parts of it are edible. You know, the leaves in winter are quite sweet. As soon as they flower, they're incredibly bitter and disgusting, but in winter, they're quite sweet. The flowers are edible. Mainly, they're just the yellow part, the green bits bitter on the flower. And we make uh, dandelion syrup or dandelion honey, um, just using the flowers. Uh, it's delicious. I've included two leaves here because there's actually 272 different types of dandelion in the UK. So the two of the most difficult plant families to learn in the UK are dandelions and brambles. Um, and yet most people feel confident in knowing their brambles and a dandelion. 
But the reason why dandelions are so common is because it's not all the same dandelion. You've got lots of different kind of species, subspecies, microspecies, all occurring in similar habitats. Um, and in, you know, on different habitats as well, which is why you see them everywhere you go. Um, but sometimes you get really, really serrated leaves. Sometimes you get much more rounded leaves, but you'd always look at them and go, it's a dandelion. But if you turn them on their side, then you understand why they're called Don de Lion, tooth of the lion from French, because it looks like a row of lion's teeth. So that's where the, that's where the name dandelion, Don de Lion comes from. And this is my grandma's old recipe for dandelion and burdock. So on the left, that is dried uh, burdock and dandelion root. On the right, it is cassia bark, ginger and star anise mixed in with simple syrup, equal parts water and sugar and black treacle. Stew it up, leave it for five days. The most delicious drink you can try. But if you like the kind of dandelion and burdock from, you know, the chippy, that's not dandelion and burdock. You know, there's only, I think there's only one company, Fentimans, that you, when they have a dandelion and burdock drink actually contains some dandelion and burdock. The rest, it's just artificial flavoring. This is the real deal. This tastes, you know, this is almost like a sticky toffee pudding kind of, you know, in liquid form. It is absolutely amazing. Yes. But not, don't be expecting it to taste like, you know, the stuff out of the tin from the chippy. So, We'll finish up talking about mushrooms. Just to give you an idea about how, because when it comes to foraging, people seem to think that plants are easier than fungi. For me, that's very alien because these are all my friends, because this is what I grew up with, going into the woods and, you know, finding all of them, making them love me. Um, but they are complicated. They're much harder to learn than plants because they're much more, each species varies in their look far more than plants. And to give you an idea of how many species there are in the UK, there's at least 4,000 species of mushroom. If we include all aspects of fungi, there are 16 and a half thousand species. That includes rust smuts, mildews. So that includes this kind of thing. So we've got like corals, eyelash fungi, earth stars, cups, and powdery mildews so fungi come in all sorts of shapes and sizes uh, generally though when it comes to what we're looking at and identifying for when we're picking our wild fungi this is the general anatomy of a fungus it has a cap a stem with gills in some cases they have embellishments like a ring on the stem or spots on the cap but that's the definition of a mushroom a mushroom is a stem a cap with gills anything else is basically other fungi that's a true mushroom. And we can go a little bit further in saying, well, when you cut it in half, that describes the flesh. We can see the gills more clearly. But look at the difference between when a young one's just starting off to as they mature. So you've got all the stages in between. And the, the one in the middle is an almost perfect specimen. But a couple of days after this, they'll start looking really weird. And these mushrooms appear and disappear within a week. So you get this whole life growth in a week and then it disappears. And if it's dry, they go very leathery. If they're really wet, they go really slimy. So there's a lot of variation within a very short window of what these things look like. And there are so many that look like each other. But whenever we're picking fungi, we're not harming them. Now, at this time of the year, usually you hear stuff from the new forest about, oh, it's now banned from picking mushrooms in the new forest doesn't work like that because as much as organizations like the Forest Commission would like to create their own laws, laws are created in the houses of parliament. The, you know, these organizations do not have the power to ban people from going into woodlands picking mushrooms as much as they'd like to. The law states legally we're allowed to take the four Fs. So that's flowers, fruits, foliage, and fungi. And you can go to lots of public spaces, lots of public parks, and you can pick your blackberries, you can pick your wild garlic, you can pick your mushrooms, so long as it's for your own personal consumption, and so long as they're not protected by law. So some plants are protected by law, all orchids, for example. There's five species of fungi that are protected by law. So rare, you don't even have to be aware of them because you're not going to find them. And the ones that are protected, you won't want to be picking to, for the pot anyway. Um, but, when we pick our mushrooms, they are the fruiting body. 
that mushroom is not the business end of a fungus. That is similar to an apple on an apple tree. And when you pick the apple, you don't kill the tree. It's the same with when we pick mushrooms. That's the fruiting body. The gills are where the spores are produced and the spores are like the seed of a plant. Although genetically, these are not plants. They are their own kingdom. They are far more closely related to you and I than they are to plants. But they associate with plants. They either grow with them or grow on them. And that's the fruiting body. That's the business end. This is a mycelium. Now, the mycelium is where is the powerhouse of a fungus. And in most cases, the mycelium is one cell thick. It is microscopic and it goes through the soil or in the trees. And this is the bit that's sourcing nutrients or breaking nutrients down, depending on which kind of fungus it is, whether it's growing symbiotically with the trees, a mycorrhizal fungi, um, which work together and swap nutrients, or if they're fungi that are rotting stuff down, saprophytic fungi, in which case the mycelium is literally decomposing everything. Either way, in a cubic square inch of soil in the UK, in the woodlands, it is estimated that there is eight miles of mycelium in one cubic inch of soil. That's how much fungi there is in the soil. Now, in most cases, you can't see it because it's one cell thick, or you might occasionally see little white strands and things like that, where it's a little bit bigger, where it's close to fruiting. This is the mycelium of honey fungus, and honey fungus produces the largest mycelium of any fungus. So big, we call it boot laces. And this is sometimes when you see rotting logs, you see these black strands around it. Well, that's the mycelium. Honey fungus is a parasitic fungus. It kills trees and it basically just chokes them, just gets underneath the bark and stops the flow of nutrients. And then the fungus starts feeding off the dying tree. Um, and that's what it looks like. This is the, the business end of a fungus. So if you damage that, you harm the fungus, not picking the mushrooms. We know that because if picking mushrooms was bad, Europe would be devoid of them because it's been done for so long, people going out picking mushrooms in Europe, and it's done on such a big scale in Europe. If it had any impact, they wouldn't be there year after year after year. And it doesn't work like that. Every year, you know, so, there's so many tons of porcini picked because they come back year after year after year. Speaking of porcini, that's what it looks like. So the Italians call it porcini. The French call it sep. We call it penny bun. It's all the same species, Belita sedulis. And it sounds exotic, but it occurs in Greater Manchester. It occurs in Rochdale commonly, so it's not that exotic. Um, it's a very, very common plant. At this stage, they are delicious, raw. But talking about this variation in fungi, this is what seps look like when they're small. This is what they look like when they're big. Now, to give you an idea, that mushroom in that picture is probably the same size as my head. That's about a kilo worth of porcini. Now, at that stage, the spores have stained the, the underside yellow. So we chop this up and we would dry it. Now you can tell it's a little bit slug eaten and probably a little bit maggoty inside, but that's the quality you're buying from the supermarket. You're not buying wonderful little fresh porcini like this from the woodland. What the rest of Europe don't want is sent off to us because we are just so, you know, inexperienced with what good porcini is like in the UK, we get the chaff and then we pay through the nose for it as well. There's absolutely nothing wrong with this, to be fair. It's just even in the supermarkets, and I've tried this at every supermarket that does that sells uh, porcini, um, you always find little maggot holes in them. There's no maggots left in them, but you can see where they were. You can see little holes. Um, but these things are just chopped up, dried, and then they hide a multitude of sins and things like that. And drive there, it really, really enhanced flavor. But a common species in Greater Manchester, most woodlands have porcini, which have uh, beech, oak, and birch. They're their favorite trees in Greater Manchester. So if you find woodlands that have got those trees, then they're, they're really, really kind of productive for fungi. Again, there are some fungi we need to be wary of. Generally, do not trust anything ginger. That mainly just applies to fungi. Don't be judging me on that, please. But um, lots of little brown gingery fungi are usually quite poisonous. This is a member of the Cortinarius family called the deadly webcap. You don't get a name like the deadly webcap without having some kind of form 
you know, and it was 1977, the last case of people dying from this fungus in the UK. Um, it's not that common, grows with coniferous trees, um, but there are fungi looking out there that will kill you in our, in our region. And the thing is, you've always got to have up-to-date literature because our knowledge is always changing. So I've got books, you know, again, behind me, I could show you which state that the brown roll rim, this beautiful species here, is edible. Well, now we know it's deadly poisonous. And you kind of think, well, how do you go from one extreme to the, to the other? And it was a Polish mycologist that discovered this. He discovered that if you eat enough of it, you'll die. Because unlike most mushrooms, the toxins in this mushroom get stored in the body and never excreted out. So eventually you will eat enough of this mushroom that your body will go, that's enough. And then just starts, your kidneys and liver will start turning to liquid, basically. So it's not the pleasant way to go. There's no pleasant way to go with mushroom poisoning. It's usually quite painful and slow. It's not instant at all. Um, and the brown brown is incredibly common. Very, very common in Greater Manchester. Loves light sandy soils with birch, parks, cemeteries. You know, these are light woodland. They are perfect for the brown rollroom. Just don't eat it. That's, the, that's the, the best I could advice I could give to you for foraging is don't eat anything poisonous. That's the best way not to poison yourself. It's as simple as that. Sounds, sounds daft, but that is, <laughs> that's the key to it. I remember being asked by BBC Radio years ago, um, and they asked me, what's the, best, uh, what's the biggest cause of, of, uh, of poisoning from foraging? And I don't think they ever appreciated my answer of stupidity. You know, if don't eat anything that you're a hundred percent, you you know, if you know what it is, fine. If you're umming and ahhing, then don't put it in your mouth for God's sake. It's just uh, you're asking for trouble. There are other species that are increasing in Greater Manchester that were not here. This is not a native species, the blue leg brownie, but it is now here and it is becoming very common, and it is also a, a category A drug. So this is banned. This is very hallucinogenic. It will be illegal to possess in any form. You know, the, the Drug Act was changed with mushrooms in 2005, six. Um, it used to be the case with things like magic mushrooms. You could only possess, it was illegal to possess them uh, in a dried form. Now it is illegal to possess any of the psilocybins in any form, even fresh. So, when I went to the, my local b and in Rochdale and discovered that the, the car park was filled with blue leg brownies, you've got to ask, is it the, is, what's making the, them their profit? Is it the kitchens or are they doing something on the side? You know, the reason why they're landscaping their, their car parks with a load of wood chip, you know, um, it's a very, this is the weird thing. Wood chip is a relatively new habitat when you think about it. You know, everyone puts it in their garden now. Everyone uses it as mulch and things like that. But up until, you know, the late 70s, 80s, when it, people started to use it, it doesn't really occur in the wild. The only place I've ever seen something similar is where you get beavers and you get that gnawing action that they do on the trees. Um, but this is, you know, if you've got wood chip in the garden, this is a mushroom coming to a, to a pile of mulch near you. Um, and it's imported from South America but now it's just spreading like wildfire and it turns blue when it's damaged. So you can see on the edge of the cap on the bottom right one there, uh, it's starting to turn blue. The gills start to turn blue, but yes, it's very psychedelic. Um, very, very potent. Don't try it. Just don't try it. You hear all sorts of horror stories with this one. Um, yeah. Interesting though. But yeah, I mean, where do you draw the line with the law? You know, if it's growing in your garden, is it, possession is it growing with intent you know it's yeah bizarre the interesting thing with fungi is there's been a massive shift in recent years about what people want to forage their fungi for so you know going back five ten years it was just fill a basket full of mushrooms in the autumn because they're delicious they're wonderful etc in the last five years there's been a massive shift towards foraging for fungi for medicinal purposes now, some of these fungi we know have medicinal purposes, others it's more anecdotal. So sometimes you have to take things with a pinch of salt until you know, we can prove one way or the other. But fungi are generally quite good at not liking bacteria and viruses. Penicillin is a fungus. Look how effective that is against bacteria. 
you know, some of the main active ingredients in HIV treatment is from a fungus because it does not like, you know, viruses and things like that. It's hardly surprising that there'll be plenty more other fungi that we're yet to discover. But one that seems to be very, very in vogue at the moment is turkey tail. In Greater Manchester, the fifth most common species of fungi recorded. And the initial research done in America with this fungus suggests that it could be very good at helping to treat certain cancers. Not in the case of like, uh, you've been diagnosed with cancer, take some turkey tail and you'll be right in the morning. It's never going to work like that. But working alongside other conventional kind of Western medicines, it could be interesting. So, the, the, so there's some clinical trials in America that have gone on where people with, with breast cancer who've had chemotherapy and radiotherapy have been given vast quantities of turkey tail extract. And what was interesting is that... Um, it seemed to really aid what was going on with the chemotherapy and radiotherapy and seemed to halt any chance of getting some secondary infections, you know, because when your immune system's really been battered, you're very susceptible to other problems. Well, turkey tail kind of helped the body defend itself as well as thought to have kind of tumor targeting properties as well. So the, the research is very much in its infancy, but it's, it's, you know, we should be excited by these things because you know, fungi probably do have that potential because they they don't like bacteria or viruses. So but they probably, some of them have got some weird and wacky defenses that we will be able to exploit as we have done with penicillin. Um, you can now buy turkey tail extract from Holland and Barrett. You will pay through the nose for it, considering it is an incredibly common fungus. But to be fair, making an extract of it in a domestic kitchen is difficult. You can make turkey tail tea. So turkey tail tea is where we get a handful in a slow cooker with like a litre of water, stew it up for a couple of hours and drink it. And it's good for the immune system. Tastes like you found some really weird fungi growing on some rotting wood in the middle of Manchester and stewed it up for a few hours. You know, it's not the most pleasant of, of teas, but we're not drinking it for its flavour. We're drinking it because of its potential health properties. Um, and turkey tail is quite a distinctive species it's a, it's a small bracket fungi so bracket fungi always grow horizontal out of a, a, a rotting log in this case and they're made up of lots of concentric zones of color this is a very blue one which is why i wanted to photograph it but often they can be quite beige or yellow or brown or ready um but for the size of them at least kind of 20 concentric rings the white at the underside would be pure white um, whereas some of their lookalikes would be grey or orange. Excuse me a moment. <coughs> um, and although some of their lookalikes aren't poisonous. So if you get it wrong, you just end up stewing up a weird fungus that you found on a log for no apparent reason. You know, it doesn't, it's not going to be medicinal, it's not going to taste nice, but you're not going to kill yourself, which is what my grandma always taught me when we're foraging for fungi. Target things. She always said to me, learn 12 and stick with those 12. Those 12 have got to be iconic, easy to identify, common, delicious, and with no poisonous lookalikes. If you go with that in mind, you can't go wrong. You need to go out into the woods thinking, I am looking for X, Y, and Z, and I'm ignoring everything else. If you just go into the wood and just stumble across mushrooms and go, I wonder if I can eat those, you're doing it the wrong way. You know, that's not the best way of doing it. It's great to wonder what they are and then happen to know if they're edible or poisonous, but not be thinking about eating them like just, just because you found some random mushrooms. Species like this wood hedgehog are a great example. So the wood hedgehog grows commonly all over the UK, wherever you get beech trees. It's kind of peachy terracotta on top and it has spines underneath the cap. It doesn't have gills, they are spines, hence why it's called hedgehog. There are all, there's only one of the mushroom, which is orangey with spines, the terracotta hedgehog. Both of them taste as good as each other. And for years, they were considered the same species anyway. So if you got the wood hedgehog wrong with the terracotta hedgehog, you have a delicious meal and vice versa. You're not going to get it wrong for anything which is poisonous. There's a couple of other fungi that do have teeth, especially if in the highlands of Scotland, but not where they're orangey peach terracotta on top. Um, so they're, they're almost foolproof. The French call these um, pieds de mouton, kind of lamb's foot, sheep's foot. Um, 
wood hedgehog is a far more descriptive name because of these beautiful spines. This is death cap, which does occur in Greater Manchester, much more common down south um, and much more common up in Cumbria. We seem to be in a little area where it's not well established. Doesn't mean it's not in your local park waiting for you to pick and get, get it wrong. But the weird thing with death cap is it smells sickly sweet, it smells like a strong live honey. And you don't want to eat it because obviously, you know, you're, you're dancing with death at that point. But people who have survived eating it say it's the most delicious mushroom they've ever eaten. Um, don't try it unless you're on death row in America and they ask, what do you want for your final meal? Although if that would happen to me, knowing my luck, I'd then get um, pardoned soon after I'd eaten it, you know, and you'd be like, damn. But anyway, I don't know why I'd be on death row. Probably poison, poison case, mass poisonings or something like that. Got it wrong. What do I know? Um, but yeah, it's this beautiful kind of sickly greeny gold colour on top. Um, so yes, we need to be very wary. But the thing is, is the, uh, the Amanita family, which the death cap is in, you just avoid them altogether. You know, you don't, even though there are edible members of the Amanita family, you just avoid them all. None of them are worth dying for. None of them taste amazing the way it's like, oh, it's really worth it. So just avoid that whole family. Just stick to very iconic, very simple ones, like the Amethyst Deceiver. You know, even though it's a small mushroom, you can often find hundreds of thousands. And I'm not even exaggerating. We did a survey, must be a decade ago now, at Tandle Hill over in Oldham. And in the beech wood there, literally every time you put your foot down, you were standing on multiple amethyst deceivers. Now, it sounds like you would just see a purple carpet. They can be, for a bright purple mushroom, they can be incredibly well camouflaged against leaf litter. When they're in moss, they're very easy to see because um, that purple stands out from the green. But in leaf litter, they can be surprisingly well camouflaged. Um, but they're this wonderful amethyst colour on the cap, the gills and the stem. There are other lilac-y coloured mushrooms, but the cap would be a different colour to the gills or the stem. So it doesn't all, you know, amethyst sievers are quite distinctive. Um, we dry amethyst sievers out in our house. We put them in a dehydrator, they dry lilac. Then we whack them in a coffee grinder and we make mushroom powder with them because some people say, well, I like the flavor of mushrooms, but I don't like the texture. Well, mushroom powder is a great way of infusing that flavor without the texture. So we've got little jars of purple powder. And then if anyone comes for a meal pre-COVID, um, haven't done since, um, then we get the little jars out if we're making a meal and right at the end, just sprinkle some over the dish. And if they ask what it is, I just say it's fairy dust and leave it at that. Um, but it's, a, it's, it's such a beautiful thing and iconic. The same with this, the chanterelle. Um, it's this lovely, rich egg yellow, but it's not a true mushroom. It's this kind of weird thing where it's not quite a mushroom. It's a fungus that's shaped like a mushroom, if this makes sense. Um, and because it doesn't have real gills, on the underside, they're infolds in the membrane. So they're more like veins. They look weird. And that's quite a distinctive feature of how you tell chanterelles, these lovely little trumpet shaped mushrooms in inverted commas with veins rather than true gills. These are absolutely delicious. And then because they're not a true mushroom, they're not, they've got a totally different kind of texture. They've got a totally different sensation to them. Um, and small ones are delicious pickled, pickled, little pickled chanterelles are absolutely delicious. Um, yeah, it's what, but like I say, it's an iconic one, easy to identify, relatively common. When you, when you go looking in the right places, chanterelle is usually like oak, birch, and hazel. Hazel often they buy, as well as beech. Um, yeah, just stick to very distinctive ones. This is generally a summer species, although it wouldn't surprise me with the weird weather we're having if I don't get an email next week saying, I found some chicken of the woods, because it's gone quite mild. Well, that can trigger mushrooms into thinking it's spring again. So chicken of the woods is, I generally find most of my best ones in May, June, but in some years I find the best ones end of September into October because it's, it, because when you get these weird seasons, you, these species are tricked into thinking it's the wrong time of year. Um, and the texture of this fungus growing out of an oak tree is like raw chicken. 
it tastes exactly the same as well. You cook it like you would chicken. You'd, in the same way you'd never eat chicken raw, chicken of the woods needs to be cooked thoroughly. Um, but And when get it when it's fresh, when it's really kind of soft and supple like this, it's great. If you let it get too old, it goes woody. And some people suffer with stomach upsets from eating it. But generally, it's when it gets too old and it's a bit woody and leathery. And it's probably no re no wonder they're having stomach upsets because your body's probably really struggling to digest it. Um, or people have eaten it raw. And then again, you don't, don't eat chicken in the woods raw. Your stomach will not appreciate it. You treat it like real chicken. You would not eat a raw chicken breast. Don't eat raw chicken in the woods either. Um, but it's a beautiful thing. Can't get that wrong. Can't get these wrong either. Scarlet Elf Cups. We're now coming into Scarlet Elf Cup season. I'm sure social media will be flooded with people eating these. Don't. So in the foraging world, some people say this is edible. The mycological world suggests it should not be eaten because when you start looking at the chemicals in this fungus, you probably would not really want to have them in your body. Um, so although it looks great having little scarlet elf cup volivants, you know, filled with little, you know, little things and whatever, you, they don't taste nice. I have eaten them. They're rubbish, really rubbish. You just, it's just one of those things that you, the first bite is always with the eyes. And when you've got these weird bright scarlet cups as a fungi, you know, they look great, but no, it's a species that's really increased though. So when I was growing up, we used to get very excited about Scarlet Elf Cup. It was not common at all. Now it seems really common. Every woodland seems to be getting Scarlet Elf Cup. Um, and it is a winter specialist. So we will start seeing it in a few weeks time and it will last all the way through. To, well, it'll keep producing different fruiting bodies right the way through to kind of March if it stays wet and, and, uh, and cold enough. A few more to show you and then I'll shut up and let you all go. You're all missing Bake Off, I think. Um, this is the Rosy Bonnet. It's a little small pinky mushroom um, that stinks of radish. Mushrooms and smell. There's quite a lot that have weird smells. Some smell of aniseed, bitter almonds, kind of radish, geraniums, stewed apples, death, all sorts of weird smells. This one smells strongly of radish. That's a little bit sweet and peppery and very earthy, but poisonous. Contains very similar toxins to what's in the fly agaric the red one with white spots but a very pretty mushroom this is our largest mushroom this is the parasol and it gets the name because this is what it looks like when it's developing that's what it looks like when it's fully open and when i was in transylvania about seven eight years ago the locals there would cut the, the cap off the stem and then batter it and deep fry it i mean at the point of where they say batter it and deep fry it, i don't care what it is i'm interested but the fact that it was a, it's that caps like 30, 40 centimeters across. It's Europe's largest mushroom. And it's a very, very weird texture. It's very marsh, marshmallowy. It's not slimy. It's not a wet mushroom, if that makes sense. It's a very dry mushroom. So it lends itself really well to being battered and deep fried. Um, yeah. Importantly, with the parasol, it has. Um, a snakeskin like appearance on the stem, these brown scales. The lookalike of this is called the shaggy parasol, which some people eat, but one in three suffer gastric upsets. That would not have the snakeskin. That has a totally smooth stem and is more shaggy in appearance anyway. But shaggy parasols occur commonly in, in gardens that have hedges like Clelandii, um, whereas parasols are, are more a meadow species. Shaggy ink cap coming to a garden near you. I only ever seem to find this now in kind of places where man has interfered, lawns, cemeteries, parks, where, where areas where grass is mown. But it's a really iconic, very safe mushroom to eat when it has not produced the ink. So you can see on the underside here, it has turned to ink. It is Delaquest, word of the day, Delaquest, turned to liquid. Um, when the gills are white, before it does that, they're edible and taste very much like tofu. Um, but as soon as the dirt gills start turning black, leave them alone. But because of this really unusual shape, because shaggy ink cap or lawyer's wig, they are sometimes referred to as, it's very iconic. You can't go wrong. So it's a great introductory species for people to feel confident in picking a mushroom, cooking it and eating it. 
Um, it's not the most, the best tasting of mushrooms. It's a nice one, but it's a good confident boost, uh, confidence boost, and usually not difficult to come across, usually in, in quite urban areas. And the last mushroom I'll leave you with is the fly agaric. I could do a whole lecture on this one species alone because there is that much mythology and folklore, but I will either enhance or ruin Christmas right now. So if anyone doesn't want their Christmas mythology ruined, or if there's any kids watching uh, that I can't see, then turn the sound off. Um, so this is the fly agaric or fly mushroom. Agaric is a word for mushroom, basically. In most parts of Eastern Europe, the name for it would basically be fly killer because the cap was put into little bowls of milk and it attracts flies and kills them. So this is that's why it's called the fly mushroom, basically. It's the fairy tale mushroom. It's the red one with white spots. A member of the Amanita family, so in the same family as death cap, it is very hallucinogenic. If you eat enough fly agaric, it will kill you, but you probably never get to that point because... Um, you'll be hallucinating as well as probably sat on the toilet whilst hoping the sink was very nearby as well. Um, but some animals do eat it, including reindeer. And reindeer eat this because it's got a mineral they struggle to get from the wild so they can eat this and get what they want. But the side effect is they start hallucinating and jumping over things which aren't there. So that then you get the Sami people up in Lapland who farm these reindeer herds who will also drink the reindeer urine because it's had most of the bad toxins filtered out and you're just left with the kind of in you, you know, hallucinogenic effect. It's thought it might be where the term getting pissed comes from to get high basically off drinking urine. Um, so then you've got the Sami people who are drinking this reindeer urine. So they're hallucinating, watching reindeer hallucinating, which jumping over things which aren't there. Before you know it, you've got flying reindeer. And there would be a tradition up in, up in Lapland, you know, that the fly agarics this time of the year are prepared and dried, ready for winter solstice. And basically on winter solstice, 21st of December, people from the, the elders from the, you know, the villages would go around to the yurts and basically hand out some dried fly agaric and say, look, it's the darkest night of the year. Let's do some mushrooms and have a good time. So then you've got the idea of a man going around from house to house and he would be dressed in the colours of the mushroom. But these yurts could get so snowed under in the middle of winter that the only way to get in and out would be through the top where obviously the smoke gets out. So then the only way in and out is through the chimney. So... Because where, of course, where is Santa, Santa from? He is from Lapland. You know, Christmas as we know it, even though it is a Christian festival, it's an amalgamation of different festivals, very pagan, some druid and things like that, into the fold. And basically what we associate with Christmas, with reindeer, with Santa and things like that, is very much taken from Lapland and the traditions up there. But you could even argue that the, the German tradition of bringing a kind of, kind of evergreen tree into the house and putting presents traditionally wrapped in red paper under the tree symbolize the mushroom growing with the tree, its host. So it, 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 everything we know about Christmas and things like that and how what we normally celebrate, it is all to do with this mushroom. It's all to do with that. So you've got, you know, your presents to thank, you've got your reindeer, to, you know, all that. It's all thanks to, to this one mushroom. I could go on and on and on. I could talk about how Beatrix Potter has ruined the British attitude towards mushroom and scared everyone through her books, even though Beatrix Potter was an amazing mycologist. And if you go up to the, um, the museum up in, up in the lakes, have a, don't look at the bloody rabbit stuff asked to see her mushroom drawings because they are some of the most beautiful illustrations of mushrooms. She was well ahead of her time in the kind of science she was illustrating with mushrooms and how they work and grow. But um, it was often said that she was uh, the Linnaean Society, the scientific kind of organization that accepts or rejects scientific knowledge, um, refused to look at her work because she was a woman. You know, and, and from that point on, she seemed to vilify fungi in her books. She seemed to kind of have a very love-hate relationship with them. Um, and the trouble is, is in her books, if kids are told from a young age, mushrooms are bad, then that kind of sticks. And after a few generations of that, we can change a whole 
perception of how, what mushrooms are like. There's many reasons for why the Brits are really poor at understanding mushrooms. I could go on. That was what my dissertation at uni was on. I could go on and on about that. But there's many reasons. But Beatrix Potter is a factor, however big or small that might be. Um, but yeah, it's fascinating. But this species is common with birch and seems to be popping out right now. So I saw some the, the other day, which were just small. They'll probably be about this size now. So if you're planning on going for a walk at the weekend, anywhere with birch trees, it's a really good place to, to start looking for fly garricks. And they're not rare. They're really, really common. They're really common species. Um, so with that in mind, I'm going to shut up now. I'll say thank you for listening. Um, please feel free to go if you want. But if you do have any questions, I am here. I am at your, your beck and call. You can either type a question or you can put something in chat. Um, that's me. I am Discover the Wild. My the social media things. I rarely do social media. I gave myself kind of two or three months off social media and it's bliss. Not great for business, you know, but for my mental health, it's been great to get off social, social media. Um, but if you have any questions, if you go, if you don't feel confident asking questions in front of people, things like that, please feel free to email me, go on my website. All the emails come through to me. Ask any questions you want. Don't immediately expect a reply because it is mushroom season. So I do try and get out as much as I can to look for these things before the first big frost. That's when the mushroom season ends, which, you know, usually at the end of October for the woodland stuff, second week of November for the grassland stuff, usually, but it depends on the weather. I mean, I was saying to Jess before, I could have gone walking in shorts and t-shirts today. It felt so mild, but then it was also, you know, going to rain as well. Um, yes. Any questions, anyone? I hope you did. I hope you did. Thank you. Thanks everyone for coming. I did, I, I did notice most people seem to be from, oh, Somerset. There you go. Some good foraging down in Somerset. The rest of everyone is quite northwest, Greater Manchester, northwest. Yeah, par, uh, Somerset's really good for parasol mushrooms. Really, really good. Yeah, it'd be, yeah. It's great. Zoom's been great. It's one of the it's one of the nicer things to have come out of COVID is the fact that it does allow us to kind of connect and kind of talk about these things, and for me to be able to go over more species in the same time scale from when we do events. But you know, I have no doubt. Hopefully, unless Jess gives really bad feedback to her bosses and things, that um, in the near future, I'm so we're doing something with city of trees where we can get out and actually get hands on with some of these species. Um, yeah, Jess, where can people view the recording? that's going up on our youtube channel probably tomorrow and then we'll share that on our twitter instagram and facebook which is all city of trees manchester so if you just look that up then you'll be able to find the link there so you can catch up excellent right everyone i'm pretty sure you'll only be halfway through bake off so you know you can go and catch up recommend a website or a book for someone prior, with no prior knowledge perhaps i'm three quarters of the way through writing one and the trouble is is this season is not great for mushrooms because september was so dry it really just put the halt on everything and even though it's been raining since it just hasn't been enough to get everything going and in some cases it's too little too late anyway um so because i'm doing the photography and the, and the text for it if the mushrooms don't bloody appear, I can't photograph them. So then we have to wait another year, uh, but there's no guarantee 2022 is going to be any better. So mine, when it's out, is the, is the correct answer. In the meantime, uh, I really like the mushroom, uh, the mushroom book that River Cottage do by John Wright. So obviously it's, it's Hugh Furley Whittensall's series of books, but he gets experts to write each book. John Wright writes the River Cottage one, probably 9 99 if you buy it new, although I think you can buy like a 10, 10 of the books in a box set for like 20 quid anyway. Um, that's quite good because it covers the most edible, most poisonous mushrooms. He all, the River Cottage series also do a hedgerow one. And the, the way they're written, they are great for a beginner. They're great for people who are more advanced as well. It's really nicely written, really nice um, layout and things. Um, it, they are 
the ones I would recommend for with no prior knowledge. Those are the ones to go for. Look at the River Cottage. One's called Hedgerow. One's called Mushrooms. Um, and then once you get the real bug for mushrooms, you'll end up getting things like this. So this is my this is a book just on the genus Rushula. So that's just one family of mushrooms in the UK out of the many, 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 many. But these these books become very expensive because they're very limited and yeah, go into all the microscopy details and it just becomes an absolute obsession. But yeah, the River Cottage one, I, I can't imagine paying more than 9 99 12 quid for it. If you are, you might be being ripped off. Um, but they're really well written, um, in my humble opinion. Um, well worth checking out. In terms of websites, I don't think there is a, there isn't one at the minute that covers all aspects of foraging really well that I'd recommend. Um, and apps, don't use apps, don't use apps. They're terrible. Some of them are all right. Some of them are better than others. But in terms of foraging, never rely on an app. Because how do you know? I, get, I see people kind of putting their phone at a plant and going, it's this. And you go, well, how do you know? The phone's telling you it's that. The phone is wrong. But unless you know what it is, how do you know if it's right or wrong? It doesn't It's just, yeah. It can be quite good for at least narrowing it down to a family and then use your own common sense to start seeing if it's right. Plants, plant apps are better than fungi apps. Plants are more reliable. Um, and there's a house plant app that I've, a friend of mine uses, which is great. If you're going around to someone's house and they've got a plant and you think, well, what's that? That looks quite cool. That's really good. But you're not intending to eat their house plants. It's just, you know, so it's not, it's just, yeah. Anyway, 